whatever time of the day or week that may be. I'd like to start by bringing this um, message from the Lord who spoke through the um, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 where he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let's join together now in the Lord's Prayer in whatever version you prefer to use in whatever language you prefer to use. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the king, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Right, we're going to join now in the song. Um, if you want to stand, that's okay. If you want to stay, remain sit, sitting, that's okay too. In between these first two songs, we'll have a time of individual worship where you can lift up your praise to God. Our first song is Hosanna, Hosanna. And we'll join that now.
So please bring your prayers, your grateful hearts to the Lord and praise him in your own words as he gives you a message for us. Hallelujah. Lord, you are the Lord of heaven and earth. You are the God who reigns over all, in all, through all. And we thank you that you are today with us in this congregation. We thank you that you've called us to yourself. We praise you and give you all the glory. Amen. Let's join together in the next song. Um, can't remember the beginning of it. What? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. So we've, we're coming today in his name to praise him. Let's join together and sing this.
Right. Our speaker this morning is Mary Hare, who's coming to us from Australia, and she's going to lead us in a prayer of confession for Lent. So we're just going to go over to her now, and hopefully she'll be with us on the screen very shortly. Thank you, Val. <clears throat> During the period of Lent, we are asked to repent and believe the gospel as we journey towards Good Friday and to Easter. So let us bring our prayers of confession to God, and at the end we shall hear words of assurance that God forgives us when we come to him in humility. Jesus says, the time is ready. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Come, let us return unto our God, who will have mercy and abundantly pardon. So let us pray. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to service as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, our pride, our hypocrisy, and our failure to be completely honest with ourselves or with other people. We confess to you, Lord, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to share the faith we have. We confess to you, Lord, Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbours, and for prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Accept our repentance, Lord, for our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord. Grant us forgiveness and time for amendment of life. Strengthen us to overcome temptation and empower us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Amen. Fellow travellers on the road to Easter, always remember that there is much more forgiveness in God than we could ever exhaust. Receive from God through the grace of Christ, the blessing of sins forgiven, and a right relationship restored. Amen. Right, we're going to sing again um, this song um, that Mary has chosen. Will you come and follow me? if I but call your name. And band are going to play this. If you would like to stand, please do so. Thank you. 
Fran's going to um, bring us the prayers for others that, um, so that we can pray together for all the situations of the world. Um, while preparing for this, I was looking at Psalm 136, um, which is a psalm of praise, and it's... Um, it was written to sort of encourage the people of Israel by reminding them of what God has done in the past in order to raise their faith about what he could do in the future. So I thought, I think I'll model today's prayers on that idea. So Psalm 136 is quite a long list of statements of things that God has done and then a refrain. Um, here's a few verses as an example from Psalm 136. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever. And I really love that. That's just a little section of it. And I really like that idea that you state what God has done in order to encourage you. So I've kind of modelled it on that. And his love endures forever is going to be the refrain that I'll get you to say in order to take part. Um, his love endures forever. Versions do different things with that. Um, some versions say things like his love and mercy endure forever. The message, you won't be surprised, says his love never quits. Um, I think we might stick with the version I've got. His love endures forever. So first, let's, let's think about our world with all its conflicts and troubles and injustices. So I'm going to say a statement about that and you're going to um, respond. His love endures forever. I'll lead you in that. So our world. To him who sent his son to the world as the prince of peace, his love endures forever. To him who has the whole world in his capable hands, his love endures forever. To him who can cause enemies to become friends and fighters to lay down arms, his love endures forever. To him who can make foolish men and women wise, wicked men and women holy, and bitter men and women mild. His love endures forever. To him who sees the world and loves it enough to offer it the chance of redemption, his love endures forever. And let's just have a moment of silence while you bring to God situations in the world you know need that endless love.
Now let's, let's bring to God our country with all its uncertainties and inequalities and its restlessness. It's the same refrain. To him who can change the hearts of a nation and turn it to himself, his love endures forever. To him who sees governments and rulers and can lead their minds to goodness, his love endures forever. To him who can bring healing to communities riven by difference, his love endures forever. To him who can find homes for the homeless and families for the lonely, his love endures forever. To him who sees who does good and can reward them with blessing, his love endures forever. Let's have a moment of quiet while you bring to God issues about our country that you know need his hand. And let's bring to God our church, our fellowship, bearing in mind all the work that happens here, all the friendships, all the fellowship, much of it behind the scenes, but God sees. To him who has led our church for so many years, holding it close to his heart, his love endures forever. To him who sees those who serve and give with glad hearts, his love endures forever. To him who also sees the tired, the weary, the disillusioned, and can reach them, his love endures forever. <coughs> to him who in his grace has provided a new minister and therefore new energy and hope, his love endures forever. And to him who holds under his wing the young from young to old and old to young. His love endures forever. Everyone here is involved in different areas of the church, so let's just have a moment of quiet where you can bring to God the concerns that are closest to you. And now let's bring to God also in quiet any individuals in the church who you know need his healing, um, his love, his comfort. Bring um, individual names to him yourself. And then I'll finish with verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 136. Lord, you know the names on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you see them all, you hear them all. And Lord, you knew those names, eternities, before we knew them. We bring to you, Lord, those who need your comfort and your healing and um, your goodness. And Lord, any who are feeling far from you, we pray that you will touch their hearts and bring them near and let them know Lord, um, how much you love them. Amen. This is verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 136, with the refrain, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Amen.
right, would the children like to go out now to their Sunday school class groups? Uh, we're going to have our um, have another song. Oh, love that wilt not let me go, which I'm having on the organ. So please stand if you feel able, and we'll join together in this wonderful hymn. now we're going to listen to the readings that Mary has requested before she comes and brings her message to us. Uh, the reading today is made up of three texts and the first one can be found on page 50 of the Old Testament in the Church Bibles. It's Exodus chapter 6 verse 28 until verse 7 of chapter 7. When the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said, I am the Lord. Report to Pharaoh king of Egypt all that I say to you. Moses protested to the Lord, I am a halting speaker. How will Pharaoh listen to me? The Lord answered, See now, I'm, I have made you like a god for Pharaoh, with your brother Aaron as your spokesman. Tell Aaron all I command you to say, and he will tell Pharaoh to tell the Israelites, leave his country. But I shall make him stubborn, and though I show sign after sign and portent after portent in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I shall assert my power in Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, 
I shall bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt in their tribal hosts. When I exert my power against Egypt and bring the Israelites out from there, then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron did exactly as the Lord had commanded. At the time when they spoke to Pharaoh, Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83. The next text can be found on the next page, 51. Exodus chapter 9, from verse 22 to verse 26. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch your hand towards the sky to bring down hail on the whole land of Egypt, on man and beast and every growing thing throughout the land. As Moses stretched his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail with fire lashing to the ground. The Lord rained down hail on the land of Egypt, hail and fiery flashes through the hail, so heavy that there had been nothing like it in all Egypt from the time that Egypt became a nation. Throughout Egypt, the hail struck down everything in the fields, both man and beast. It beat down every growing thing and shattered every tree. Only in the land of Goshen, while the Israel Israelites lived, was there no hail. The last text can be found on page 30 of the New Testament. It's Mark chapter 1 from verse 9 to verse 14. It was at this time that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens break open and the Spirit descend on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, and you I take delight. At once the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness, and there he remained for forty days tempted by Satan. He was among the wild beasts, and angels attended at his knees. After John had been arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Thank you, Julia. All right, and now we're going to um, go over to Mary again in Australia. Thank you, Val. Uh, before I start, I'll just tell you a little story, um, something that happened this morning. Uh, this morning, my time, the middle of the night, your time, I guess. Um, I was watching Songs of Praise, and it came from uh, the UK. The Songs of Praise that is shown in Australia is from the UK. And they were showing um, a messy church. It was an Anglican church where they are having um, a session of messy church. And they happened to be um, talking about the story of Moses and illustrating certain aspects of it, like the burning bush and other aspects of the story. And um, they asked one little girl, uh, what did you learn today? And she said, I learned that Moses didn't do what he wanted to do. He listened to God and he did what God wanted him to do. So I thought that was a wonderful message for us at this time. Uh, I could actually stop now and not give my sermon and just we could reflect on that message. But I, I, will, I will continue and give my message but I thought that you would like to hear that because I certainly was very pleased to hear it myself. So, the Lord said to Moses, you shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. 
my version is slightly different from yours and I noted that in yours it says make stubborn Pharaoh's heart but it's the same harden or make stubborn I think are the same me me meanings in our reading from Exodus today, we take up the story of Moses and his great mission, the deliverance of the Israelite people from oppressive slavery in Egypt. At a time after Moses had encountered God in the burning bush, there God had revealed himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and told Moses that he is the one who will lead the people of God out of their slavery in Egypt. But Moses is quite nervous and lacking in confidence that he can do this. This is especially so because Moses' leadership involves confronting Pharaoh, the great king of Egypt, and demanding that Pharaoh release the Israelites. We read in verse 28 of Exodus chapter 6, Moses saying, Since I am a poor speaker, why would Pharaoh listen to me? In addition, Moses was doubtful that his own people, downcast from their oppression by the Egyptians, would believe him when he told them that he would bring them out of an Egyptian slavery to the promised land a land flowing with milk and honey. Yet God built up Moses' confidence by giving him signs, changing his staff into a snake and back again, his hand into a leprous hand and back, and changing water from the river Nile into blood. These signs which he could show his people and which later he showed to Pharaoh. And his brother Aaron was to be his voice, his prophet, in the encounters with Pharaoh. So that when they went to the Israelites, the people believed that Moses would deliver them. They believed in God again and bowed down and worshipped him. <laughs> Pharaoh was another matter, however. His heart was hardened or made stubborn, and his ability to listen to Moses and to God was limited by his own stubbornness and his sense of superiority and power. Worshipped as a god by the Egyptians, Pharaoh was not going to accept Moses' god in a hurry. The Egyptian gods were numerous and ranged from everything important in nature like the sun and the river Nile, to Pharaoh himself. When Moses and Aaron went to him to ask him to let the Israelites go to worship God in the wilderness, Pharaoh said he did not know their God, and he refused. He made the work that the slaves, the, the Israelites who, his, who were his slaves were doing even more difficult or really nearly impossible. They were making bricks and he took away their supplies of straw for this, straw being needed to make Egyptian bricks strong enough for their climate. He demanded that they still produce the same quota of finished bricks while having to seek the straw themselves throughout the land. So the Israelites doubted and railed against Moses making him more nervous. But then we have an exchange of signs initiated by God's instructions to Moses and Aaron, a contest between them and Pharaoh and his magicians. You can imagine this very strange scene, Moses and Aaron on the one hand and Pharaoh's wise men on the other hand with their staffs being turned into snakes. But Moses and Aaron's snakes swallowed up by Pharaoh's and showed, showed the superior, superiority of their God's powers. Sorry, I think I got that wrong. I'll say that again. 
Moses and Aaron's snakes swallow up, swallowed up Pharaoh's snakes and showed the superiority of God's power. When God sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, he promised to show the Israelites by these mighty acts that the God of their fathers was alive and worthy of their worship and to show the Egyptians that their gods were nothing, completely inferior to Moses' God. The theme is also the protection of God's people and confirming his promise to Abraham and his descendants of God's relationship with them, which ultimately results in the coming of Jesus as our saviour. The story in Exodus continues with plagues inflicted on the Egyptians because of Pharaoh's hard heart, his stubbornness and failure to let the Israelites go out of slavery. Pharaoh was asked to repent and believe in God. We are also asked this by Jesus during the period of Lent. Pharaoh was given many choices and chances to repent and listen to God. He didn't because he had a false sense of security in his own power and trusted in himself and his false gods just as we are also prone to do. As Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he refused to let Moses' people go, God worked through Moses to demonstrate his power and to give Pharaoh a chance to repent. Through nine plagues inflicted on the Egyptians, ranging from turning the river Nile to blood, sending frogs, gnats and flies, the death of livestock through a pestilence, boils, thunder and hail, locusts and dense darkness over the land for three days. Our second reading from Exodus was about the plague of severe hail. As Moses stretched out his staff, the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire which came down on the earth destroying everything in its path. We notice, however, that in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were living, there was no hail. The sign of God's protection and their escape from destruction is there, as in the other plagues. Yet each time when Pharaoh entreats Moses to make God cease his plagues, When Pharaoh admits his sin and says he will repent and let the Israelites go, after the relief from each plague comes, when the plague stops, Pharaoh changes his mind. His heart is again hardened, and so his eventual destruction is assured. We are all familiar with the last plague, the tenth one, the most severe one the death of the firstborn in each household in Egypt. And then even after Pharaoh relents and lets the Israelites leave, Pharaoh again changes his mind, chases them, and his army is destroyed in the Red Sea. Sometimes we read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. At other times that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is a little bit strange, isn't it? God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh initially did that himself may reflect the culmination of Pharaoh's persistent cruelty and persistent refusal to heed divine warnings. It reminds us that our hearts can also become hardened when we insist on our own way our own sovereignty and resist serving others. Paul in Romans chapter 9 and verse 17 lets us know that God used Pharaoh's stubbornness in his plan to show his might, his justice and also his saving grace. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, 
I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. We are not powerful rulers like Pharaoh, but we can relate to that stubbornness, determination to have our own way, that turning away from God and a needing to worship the secular gods around us, submitting to the sins of pride, greed, and many other sins rather than seeking to serve God and others. But God can save us from this slavery from sin, just as he delivered the people of Israel from slavery under Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Jesus came as the only one who would not fall into these sins and could make the choice which would give us all the possibility of freedom and release from our enslaving sin. In the story of Jesus' baptism, which we read from Mark's Gospel, the picture of the heavens torn apart and the spirit like a dove on Jesus gives us a dramatic picture of the ripping apart of the barrier between heaven and earth and God coming to us. We know that this is the Son of God who has been sent to break down the barrier between us and God caused by our sin. In Mark's fast-paced story about Jesus' temptation, we see a human being who is also God, struggling with Satan in the desert, with wild beasts, and ministered to by angels. It is a story about the greatest choice which there has ever been in anyone's life, whether or not to accept the way of the cross, the choice which Jesus made on our behalf, Put in its starkest form, it was a life and death choice for all humankind, for all of us. Paul lets us know that through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, God has worked a great reversal of this scenario of sin in our world. It is a great restoration of the beautiful condition in which this world and people in this world were made. We no longer have to be slaves to sin and death, but have been blessed by the outpouring of undeserved and unconditional love in Jesus. Paul states, one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. There was a lot riding on Jesus' temptations and the, joys and the choices he made. If God was to follow God's, if Jesus was to follow God's agenda, to work this great reversal and restoration, to bring goodness and life for all creation, he had to be obedient and worship God alone, saying no to all man-made gods and agendas, the model and, and agenda which God had chosen is that of the servant king laying down his life for us all. It is the opposite of proud King Pharaoh's agendas and his worship of all manner of gods and above all himself and his false belief in his own power, which came crashing down in his encounter with the true God. God made everything and his creation was beautiful. Yet sin spoiled it and continues to do so. Time and time again he has forgiven and protected his people and renewed his promises as we read throughout the Old Testament. For example, in the story of Noah and the rainbow of hope and promise after the flood, God's plan is to restore this beauty. So, as we journey to restoration this Lent, let us recognize the faithfulness of God throughout history. 
Let us recognize that God has a plan, that we, the people of God, are part of that plan, and that God is waiting for us to join in, be changed and be transformed. What of our own choices in the coming days? How do we listen to God as he leads us with a new minister in our outreach to those around us to share the gospel through both our words and our deeds? Shall we cling to our old ways, old gods, our arrogance, our feeling of superiority, or repent and listen to where he is leading us as pilgrims on the journey to bring his kingdom nearer. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of the 19th century, said in his sermon about Pharaoh, Forget Pharaoh and only think of yourself. Let the Lord Jesus himself, with the thorn-crowned head and the pierced hand, stand by your pew, and looking right down into your soul, say in his matchless tone of music, the music of the heart of love, how long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Or in our more modern version, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? In this time of Lent, it means being humble, as Pharaoh was asked to be, acknowledging and repenting of our failures. In Australia, there has been a recent productivity report which shows that closing the gap initiative for First Nations people, for example, regarding health, housing, education, rates of imprisonment, that these initiatives are only on target for four out of 19 initiatives, meaning that the gap between Indigenous people and other people in Australia is being closed in only a few cases. And some have gone backwards because there is a winner best from many of those who are organising the funds. In other words, a lack of humbling oneself from all parties, as Spurgeon reminds us. And in many countries, like the UK and in Australia, how can we tackle the large poverty gap for children in disadvantaged situations? The oppression they face made worse by spiraling housing costs and general cost of living. Seeking structural change, I believe, may be as important as giving generously to those in poverty. But how do we work together to improve these things? How do we do this with differing views while maintaining our unity to which we are called in Christ? I believe we need to pray about this. We know that we are not alone in tackling many forms of oppression. When Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. God is with us wherever we are and whenever we tackle the discrimination and wrongs of this world. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. God gave Moses the resources of his brother. God gives us companions fellow workers on the way, if we can love each other and respect each other. Finally, in this time of Lent, can we be ready for the healing and restoring power in our lives and those whom we are called to touch? Can we be ready for this release of sin, this release from sin by Christ, for his restoration of our lives? so that we do not harden our hearts to his word to us. Let us today in the first Sunday of Lent repent of our apathy, our lack of courage, and see how we are called to follow Jesus, the beloved Son of God, who made it possible 
for us also to be called beloved children of God. Amen. And in response, let us sing the hymn, Breathe on us, Breath of God. Let's sing it as a prayer that God will instill in us the desire to seek his will. Thank you. Right, there are seem to be coming in late. <laughs> okay. Never had this problem before. Okay, right. We'll go to, go to the notices. There's just two that I want to. I'll use this one. Still doing it. Anyway, there's no craft games and chat this Thursday afternoon. The organizers are away. There's a notice about streams on uh, the notice sheet, um, but it doesn't have the date on it. So streams is actually on Monday the 26th of February. That's a week tomorrow but the rest of the information on the notice sheet is correct. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to now read a blessing over you. I bless you in, the na in Jesus' name that every good thing the Father has for you 
might be fully released and that Jesus might be exalted among you. I bless you that his high calling for you might be manifested in love. I bless every hurting or wounded soul in Jesus' name, that the Comforter might give you grace upon grace. I bless you that gentleness, peace and joy might flood every heart and every relationship. Amen. Now let us give one another a blessing as we say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.